Hi everyone, I'm Jack Cush with Room Now. Welcome to the Osteoarthritis Roundtable from ACR 2021. I'm joined by an austere group of researchers in the area. We need more research, we need more data, we need more therapies in osteoarthritis. This group is going to review with us some of the things that were highlighted from the meeting. I'll let them introduce themselves. Tahina. Great, thank you. Hi, I'm Tahina Neoji. I'm a rheumatologist and epidemiologist, professor at Boston University School of Medicine and chief of rheumatology. Hi, I'm Kent Kuo. I'm a rheumatologist epidemiologist and at the University of Arizona in Tucson. I'm chief of rheumatology and director of the Arthritis Center. Hi, I'm Jillian Hawker. I am a rheumatologist and clinical epidemiologist at the University of Toronto. I'm the chair of the Department of Medicine and a professor of medicine, obviously, and rheumatology. And hi, I'm Martin England. I'm a professor at the Department of Orthopedics, Lund University, Sweden. You know, I usually go to Lund every January, but it hasn't happened the last two years. Um, so Lund's a special place you should visit if you ever get the opportunity. Um, so let's start off with, I've asked the, the, this group to uh, come together and sort of present some of the highlights from the meeting. Uh, Kent, why don't you start us off with something that you uh, thought was uh, worth reviewing? Yeah, there was a, a abstract from Phil Conahan's group that used uh, unsupervised uh, machine learning, two different methods um, based on OAI data, baseline data to identify different clinical phenotypes. And so they identified um, eight different uh, phenotypes and there was um, from the two different uh, machine learning methods and looked at trajectories of patient reported outcomes uh, in terms of pain, uh, function, also in terms of structure. Um, and they actually showed there was um, some overlap between uh, these two um, uh, methods. So that gives credence that uh, in terms of the results that there was. And I think this is uh, important for the field to know because um, and we know that uh, osteoarthritis is a whole joint disease, but it's very heterogeneous. And so we need uh, better clinical phenotypes uh, for observational studies, but clearly for clinical trials um, for us to enroll the right patients for the right treatments in order to then uh, have uh, improved outcomes. And um, you know, one of the things that we'll talk about is the fact that we don't have any structure modifying uh, treatments um, in osteoarthritis somewhat due to the heterogeneity, but also the challenges in terms of uh, running clinical trials. And I think we'll talk about that more. Um, so machine learning has the ability, I guess, to give us the edge. You know, sometimes uh, our therapies are coin toss. And if we can, you know, cluster groups and find better treatments or better outcomes, do you think we get that from the study? I mean, trying to get a clinical cluster from a NEOA cohort, is that a reasonable ask here? Well, I think it's a reasonable first step. Um, you know, you're right, Jack. The problem with machine learning is people think of it as uh, magical. I mean, it'll, it'll give you results, um, but oftentimes it's not validated. Um, and so we certainly see machine learning, artificial intelligence tossed around a lot. Um, but um, the idea is that, you know, what we find in one cohort needs to be validated in another cohort to really then see if this is clinically useful. And I think, um, you know, there are certainly efforts within the field to uh, put different cohorts together. Um, and then that, you know, in terms of having more big data. Um, and then I think we see that, you know, in other fields, certainly in terms of the GWAS studies, they started smaller and now, you know, 10,000 people, 100,000 people. Um, you know, that's where we need to uh, get to in um, osteoarthritis in terms of looking at these various cohorts and uh, better understanding, you know, you need the large numbers to discern heterogeneity. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, the fact that we've not yet had any proven, approved uh, structure modifying drugs um, points to the likelihood that the simple approach of enrolling Kelvin and Lawrence grade two or three knees with a certain level of pain is um, not working. And we might be discarding promising treatments because we couldn't find the signal for the noise. And I, hopefully I completely agree, Tina. Yeah, yeah. Sorry for, for interrupting. But no, no, go ahead. Please keep going. Okay. No, no, I, I, I totally agree. I think that is one of the main challenges we had to recognize that always sort of is representing very different conditions or, or, or um, 
a wide set of conditions. And I think with the breakthrough in the future won't be a sort of a drug that treats all of it. It will probably be for a specific phenotype. We will see some, some, some breakthrough in the future. That's also one of the things. Go ahead. Sorry, that machine learning is as good as the data that we throw into it. And so I'm concerned that we don't really have cohorts that have detailed information about all the joints affected, about symptoms in a, in a more colorful and multidimensional manner. Um, they're too simplistic. And I think until we actually have really rich data collected on people early in their disease or even along the spectrum of the disease, we're just going to see the, the same few variables come out because right now we're only collecting a, a small number of variables on the cohorts that we have. I completely agree with you, Jillian, that, that certainly it's limited by the data that was available in OAI. And um, we didn't have, um, they didn't include the MRI data, but um, certainly the, the issue is that um, there's a variety of patient reported outcomes and many changes that have gone on that aren't in the existing cohorts. Um, and so there, we need to be smarter about how we collect this data and, and who we're collecting on. You're, you're absolutely right. You know, the cluster analysis revealed some interesting clusters, one males with a little bit of pain, but high functioning. But the one that jumps out off the page at me as a non-OA guy was um, females, obese, high comorbidity, depression. I mean, that's fibromyalgia. And that's a big, you know, I mean, it's not labeled as such, but certainly phenotypically looks like it is. But how, how do we, you know, how do you adequately study OA when you have your, your comorbidities tainting your, your data sets? So I guess what I would say, Jack, is that, um, I, you know, it's fibromyalgia-like that we know that there's uh, different pain, um, you know, acute pain um, and different types of pain. Tahina's done a lot of work in terms of helping us understand different types of pain um, and pain sensitivities. Um, and so I think that, again, there's the heterogeneity there. And so one phenotype is a, a chronic pain phenotype that is, you know, maybe consistent or similar to fibromyalgia in terms of where the overlap is. And, and certainly, you know, treatments that um, would target more central uh, pain with central sensitization versus other types of pain um, uh, would be important in terms of, again, sorting out those different uh, phenotypes. And I don't know, Tina, you, know, you want to talk about in terms of that, that pain more? Um, sure. I mean, I, uh, I was going to throw it to, to Jillian because multimorbidity in OA is really her, her thing, but I'll just make a, a brief comment that, yeah, pain mechanisms are really understudied in all of our rheumatic diseases, not just OA. And, uh, you know, a, a four out of 10 pain in one person doesn't mean that it's exactly the same mechanisms contributing to that pain experience as another person. And so this is yet another complex layer of phenotyping that we need to understand what is contributing to someone's pain. And this fibromyalgia like phenotype might actually be um, the, the central nervous system having no lesions, no, there's no evidence of neuropathic pain, neuropathic lesions, nerve lesions, but there is uh, evidence for facilitated ascending signaling or um, inadequate descending inhibition. And the International Association for the Study of Pain has labeled um, a term nociplastic pain, where there's no obvious uh, lesion, but there's altered functioning of that nociceptive signaling pathways. But Jillian, the multimorbidity is uh, up your alley. Well, both, because people living with OA who also have other comorbid conditions typically don't get anybody paying any attention to their OA, even though they may be asking their healthcare providers for help. And so they're traditionally grossly underdiagnosed and undertreated. If you don't treat somebody's pain, the likelihood of them developing nociceptive plastic pain um, is much, much higher. So uh, to me, that when, we, when you react as you did, which is how many of my rheumatology colleagues uh, react, it's, it's actually missing the fact that these are people with unmanaged osteoarthritis who have developed generalized pain because we haven't taken care of them. So, and we know that the undertreatment is much, much higher in the presence of multimorbidity, particularly the cardiometabolic conditions, which of course are life-threatening and therefore not at, are perceived as more important. So um, again, it's just, it, we need to think about the, the root cause of that pain 
um, and treat it. And there so may be also, um, you know, race, ethnicity, and sex differences in terms of how we approach and treat pain. And so that also leads to some of the disparities that we see in osteoarthritis. Right. That was abstract 211. Um, since maybe it's better to treat the disease by not getting the disease. Um, Jillian, abstract 482. The metformin one. Um, <laughs> yeah. So this, this is interesting because there've been um, a back and forth between clinical and preclinical and clinical uh, studies looking at the role of metformin. Metformin obviously being a type two diabetes agent, glucose lower, lowering agent. Um, I am not a basic scientist, but basically the preclinical studies have shown a, a protective effect of metformin on OA through uh, activating the AMP activating protein kinase or AMPK signaling pathway. And in animal models, um, uh, activation of the AMPK signaling pathway has re reduced the loss of joint space over time, reduced um, pain, and um, they've shown that it's, it's actually when you have mice that are deficient in that pathway, um, they can't, the, the metformin effect is absent. So this study was a, a administrative data analysis using one of the many um, insured uh, private insurance schemes in the US, millions of patients. And basically what they did is they took people with and without type two diabetes um, and focused on in this group, those with type two diabetes who had received metformin in a previous two year period and who had received no diabetes uh, therapies. So the group that was on other therapies was excluded for the primary analysis. They looked forward over time uh, for uh, incident diagnosis of osteoarthritis based on claims codes. So two codes uh, a few months apart. And what they showed is a significant reduction in incident uh, osteoarthritis based on claims codes. So treatment for OA effectively or a diagnosis of OA um, in people on metformin and the, the uh, hazard ratio was about 0.77 and it was statistically significant. They also looked at joint replacement um, over time, time to joint replacement. It was also reduced. The effect was smaller, but they did see an effect. They did do a sensitivity analysis where they looked at the sulfonylurea group as a, as a comparator uh, drug. So those on metformin versus those that received a sulfonylurea and um, they replicated the results suggesting that there is something happening with metformin and um, the basic pathophysiology of osteoarthritis. The, the inflammation that we now understand is very active and it seems to be very much in the pathway that we now recognize is, is, um, is um, constituently, um, is, is mediated by macrophages basically and inflammatory uh, 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 factors. So um, the other clinical studies have looked at people with obesity um, predominantly. And um, I think, Honestly, this is a drug that I think needs to go to clinical trials, but it won't be very useful if we don't have um, earlier people, people earlier in the stage of their OA brought into these clinical trials. So these data suggest prevention of incident disease, or at least based on the way they've studied it. Um, to do this, we would have to have a way to in uniformly and in a standardized fashion bring in early stage OA to clinical trials. But I think it's exciting. It, it's exciting and it makes sense. There's an awful lot of overlap between diabetes and osteoarthritis. And, you know, it's a chicken and egg kind of phenomenon. Um, we've shown in previous work that people with, uh, with osteoarthritis are at increased risk of developing diabetes. And others have shown the same thing. And that's probably related to um, physical activity, walking, etc. But in fact, there may be a codependence uh, with respect to metabolic syndrome and common risk factors. So that was that was that study uh, came from Stanford, um, and I think just another sort of um, growing amount of evidence that metformin has some kind of potential benefit in early OA as a preventive measure. 
So linking it up mechanistically is important because there are a lot of studies, retrospective studies in RA and other diseases that show the same association, metformin, less disease, better disease, let, you know, whatever. But in prospective, in early, you know, in preclinical RA, it didn't work. So mechanistically, you know, is this the TA17 anti-inflammatory effect? Um, is this, as you say, just a reversal of the OA diabetes association? Is this a microbiome effect? Again, we if we knew mechanistically how it worked, I think we could feel better about prospectively studying it. I mean, even a simple question of was it mediated through weight loss since metformin would be associated with weight loss, whereas sulfonylureas wouldn't. Um, and with that kind of admin database, we can't assess whether that that's the mediation. Yeah, importantly, the study could not control for BMI or physical activity. Um, it, they couldn't control for any of the really potentially on the uh, causal pathway um, uh, for the founders. So uh, I think it's just another observation, but it's by far a definitive uh, study. I think the animal models are, are really provocative, though, particularly right. with the uh, mice with obliterated AMPK. Uh, uh, one alpha is it's we need more we need more study but it's 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 provocative it is Julian, do you study. think you think you, you we should go straight for the trial or do we need more observational data what's your what's your opinion well it, it's funny as as jack was saying i think i think we need prospect prospectively collected data to date all of the the clinical studies and actually, there's a really nice review in osteoarthritis and cartilage as a result of the last ORSI meeting of metformin. Um, but they're, they are retrospective administrative or large cohort studies. I think we need the prospective studies. Uh, um, and I don't know, I, I kind of think a, a small trial, metformin is a well-used drug. I, I think we should give it a try. Uh, I, I would. So Jillian, the, the question, you know, we talked about different phenotypes. So I think that if we were to do a trial, it would be important to enroll the, quote, the right type of people that might, yeah. would be most likely to respond. Do you think that are those that have evidence of infl inflammation, evidence of metabolic syndrome? What, what would your recommendations be in terms of uh, those we should put into a trial? Well, I was just looking at the study population of this particular um, case control study, and they were over 40, 40 or over, with a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes. And um, frankly, that's a pretty common diagnosis, a pretty large population. Um, and probably anywhere from 30 to 50% of those people will develop OA. So uh, I, I would probably take the type 2 diabetes population. Um, now, the, the problem with that is if they already have diabetes, you know, are you restricting, are they going to get metformin anyhow? Um, however, you could go earlier to quote unquote pre-diabetes, which I think was that obesity study. So I think you'd have to have somebody with obesity for sure. Um, and probably 40 to 45 um, and over probably that window of 45 to 55 kind of thing with obesity. And do you think whether we should try to enroll people that have more evidence of uh, inflammation, whether um, by imaging or, um, you know, high uh, sensitivity CRPs? Well, good question. I haven't been terribly convinced that the any of the biomarkers were terribly discriminatory. And I think obesity um, is probably the best indicator of inflammation. So I, I would go with people that particularly have centripetal obesity. Um, and I, I'm not, I haven't seen great data using CRP as a way to distinguish those who do and do not have inflammation at the joint level. Have, have you, Kent? No, I guess I was um, commenting, this is a little off track, but you know, there was the um, abstract presented this meaning of intra-articular um, kenokinumab, and that didn't show a, a difference um, between um, kenokinumab and um, uh, placebo, but they did show that in those patients that had elevated high sensitivity CRPs, um, there was a, a difference uh, in terms of response. And so um, I agree with you that the, the data on some of the inflammatory markers have been underwhelming, but um, I, my thought was that at least 
use the data we have at hand and protect, potentially collect other information to try to understand then um, sure. mechanistically in terms of those that may respond or may not respond um, if you're doing a, you know, an early phase two to then think about the right sort of people to put into a phase three. And you could stratify. You know? Exactly. Um, I think uh, the, the HSCRP of at least two in the intra-articular mount trial comes from the original CANTOS trial where there was demonstration of a pretty substantial lower uh, likelihood of having a knee or hip replacement and the combined kenikinumab doses versus placebo, which I think was is really interesting and goes back to the point of you know phenotyping and are we missing signals for the noise? So prior IL-1 beta uh, programs in the early phase were equivocal or were negative um, or numerically when one study was maybe a numerical positive signal, but not statistically significant. And those programs did not move forward, smaller sample sizes. Now you've got Cantos, 10,000 people randomized. And while they didn't prospectively evaluate OA, et cetera, they had self-report OA. So even in the smaller group that had self-reported OA, um, they were able to see the signal. It's not possible in OA to have you know, trials of 10,000 people to get this signal. Um, and so, you know, whether it's HSCRP or whether that's related to their obesity, there's something there. Um, really one of the most exciting first signals that we, we've seen um, for a biologic target that makes sense. Um, and so again, raising questions of why we're failing in other programs when uh, in this large program, you'd be able to find a signal. Let's move on to, um, speaking of therapy, um, NSAIDs, Tahina. Sure, so uh, I'm taking a little bit of uh, panelist prerogative and presenting some work that Martin England and I did with his team in Sweden, where we, um, you know, th the motivation for this study is that we know that opioids are widely used in OA management, even though treatment guidelines strongly recommend against use of uh, non-tramadol opioids, or at least conditionally against tramadol opioids. And, that was the ACR AF guideline that was um, published, um, you know, just last year. And we had a patient panel that you know, they expressed they don't want to use opioids, but given how little uh, is available for helping to manage away, they didn't want it to be taken away completely as an option. Um, so we know that people with osteoarthritis, if they are prescribed a medication, they're highly likely to be prescribed um, NSAIDs, but also highly likely to be prescribed opioids. So we really, um, you know, we're interested in, well, what happens when you take into account multimorbidity in osteoarthritis? And we know about two thirds of patients with OA have multimorbidity. And many of those comorbidities are contraindications to using NSAIDs, or at least you should use NSAIDs with um, caution because there are precautions. So we took data from um, a Swedish population-based registry identified people with incident knee and hip osteoarthritis. So we ended up with about 30,000 individuals. And then we looked at in the first year um, after their diagnosis, what treatments were they given that we can discern from the registry data, prescription NSAIDs, prescription opioids, or referral to PT. Overall, we found about 9% of the cohort had contraindications to use of NSAIDs. So GI bleed, um, renal insufficiency, CKD stage three or worse, um, or acute renal failure. And about 22% had some kind of precaution for NSAID use, such as GERD, congestive heart failure, cardiovascular disease, other milder renal issues. What was surprising is people with absolute contraindications to NSAIDs were still prescribed NSAIDs at, with a prevalence of about 22%. And um, those that had contraindications to NSAIDs were about one and a half times more likely to be prescribed opioids. In contrast, um, no matter whether which type of contraindication or precaution, every group had lower likelihood of having a physical therapy referral. So we already know in the US that physical therapy referral and lifestyle counseling by primary care physicians where the majority of OA care occurs is quite low, woefully, pitifully low. 
and that prescription for NSAIDs and opioids continue rising. And here we now have in, in this Swedish registry data, a similar finding that um, PT is woefully underutilized, including in high risk people, that prescription NSAIDs are continuing to be prescribed even when people have contraindications, highlighting the paucity of alternatives for these patients to manage their pain. To Jillian's point, a lot of these individuals are not having their pain managed adequately and you know, are compelled to use NSAIDs. And then most disturbingly that the people who are most vulnerable and high risk are getting more opioids. And I think it also um, sort of speaks to this uh, um, kind of hidden pandemic of unmanaged pain. Um, so these people with OA who have contraindications to NSAIDs, 22% are getting NSAIDs, about 22% similar prevalence are getting opioids. What are the rest getting? Um, and, and so I think it speaks to you know, the urgent need for more options for our patients and to engage physicians, um, primary care physicians in particular, um, to in, uh, institute first line therapies that can be beneficial and helpful, particularly when someone has contraindications to NSAIDs. Martin, do you think that uh, this data reflects the people who are managing these patients? This is the primary care sector as opposed to a specialized um, provider in musculoskeletal medicine? Uh, these data cover both primary care and, and uh, secondary care and patient. So all levels are included actually in this, this, this analysis we did. Uh, so, and I, but, but maybe the big take home is, is I think, what Utina said, at least it highlights really the tremendous need of more th better therapies for to manage a way. And we have, a, I mean, we have a good primary sort of care management that is exercise and weight management and information. That's really good. But then when we need that, that is not enough. That's where the big need is. And I think we start to clearly illustrate that currently we have an NSAID and opioids. I mean, more or less. And so I think we really need to sort of work hard in the resource community to, uh, together with the industry to find other ways or, or other, other treatment options uh, to, to manage these patients in great need. Hina um, and Martin, was there any dis um, data available on non-pharmacologic um, measures for OA in these groups? So yes, it's in register. We, we do see uh, referrals to physiotherapy. So we can't pinpoint what exactly the physiotherapy was for, if it's for the knee or for back pain or neck pain. It's just, it's registered as a, as a you know, visit to physiotherapist. Yes. So, so in, the, in the Swedish system, that's sort of, we have a very generous uh, healthcare system, so paid by the government. So, so all visits in healthcare are registered so in the same um, database, so to speak. Lauren King, a doctoral student and rheumatologist um, in Toronto, has published previously almost exactly the same um, analysis of over 2,000 people going for knee replacement. And again, underscoring one under treatment, a lot of these people, I think it was 57% had received exercise, weight loss if they were overweight and, and any analgesic therapy. These are people going for knee replacement. Um, she looked at opioid use, which was not uncommon. It was more commonly seen in people with contraindications to anti-inflammatories, but it didn't explain the high opioid use. So very similar results in a cohort going for uh, primary knee replacement for OA. Interesting. All right, that was abstract 483. Um, um, Martin's going to present um, a really interesting abstract 480 about regression to the mean something that bothers any of us who do clinical trials. Martin. Yes, I, I did as Tina you know, took the liberty to highlight my own my own abstract because I think it's so great. Now, but I really think it's an important topic that's usually gets forgotten in interpretation of, of data and also confuses clinicians uh, what they believe uh, they are when they're uh, seeing effect and when, what is an effect really. So I um, mean regression to the mean is, is a phenomenon uh, that is typically prone to happen uh, uh, in, in uh, medical science when, when the symptoms fluctuate over time greatly. As, as we now know, OA pain is usually fluctuating a lot over time. And there is a, a great risk or concern that patients usually see their doctor or becomes enrolled in a trial when they are having a flare. 
And, and that means that they are just by the natural fluctuation more likely to improve uh, uh, over time. So not at all related to the intervention we received, just the way that the pain fluctuates. So uh, I was really interested to see uh, signs of this phenomenon in using uh, population-based data from Denmark on a primary care intervention for, uh, for osteoarthritis uh, called the GLAD program. So, so we, we uh, and what we looked for was two signs in this data uh, of regression to mean, and that is first a lower uh, baseline score uh, uh, in, in pain than in the underlying uh, population with, with uh, osteoarthritis, uh, with symptomatic osteoarthritis. So, in, so suggesting that the, the patients then sort of start this treatment or are motivated enough to go through this when they are sort of in a flare. And, and the second sign we looked for was that the improvement was uh, much more apparent in those with a lot of pain and in contrast, very little improvement or actually even worsening in, in those with, with little uh, pain in the data set. And, and uh, we found very clear evidence or, or, or in this data set of both these, these uh, aspects. For instance, the difference in the post 12 pain was in the range of 16 to 19 points. So there were much more worse pain in, 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 the, in the, those enrolled in, the, uh, uh, in this uh, primary care intervention than in the in underlying population with this symptomatic disease. So, uh, and also, it's, I mean, this really also um, makes me question how, how effective are these uh, interventions really? I mean, the only way to do that is that you really, really need randomized controlled trials with a placebo intervention to tease the effective part out. But it's also very challenging to perform in, 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 a, in an intervention uh, such as exercise. So, but it, uh, and also I think it's it, because you often see these results sort of used in marketing in different ways that uh, uh, oh see how much they improve from baseline, but they never tell how much is that is actually like, just reflecting uh, regression to the mean, uh, and it's likely to be substantial. Uh, uh, I would say. So I think that's that's uh, something I would I, I would like to highlight just to make researchers and also patients more aware of this phenomenon and, and be critical when they view data. Uh, any thoughts from my, my colleagues? Uh, I think that uh, it's an important issue, uh, Martin. Um, uh, you know, we we looked at that in OAI, and it, it seems that the you know, regression to the mean is um, more prevalent when you have. Uh, measurements that are more variable. And so um, blood pressure or pain levels, mm -hmm. whereas if you're measuring uh, joint space with, um, you don't see that same sort yeah. of issue. But so in terms of flaring, I guess the, the question is, are there strategies that um, could try to minimize this um, in terms of trying to think about people that have um, more persistent uh, pain levels um, versus uh, more fluctuating pain. Of course, then that may limit some generalizability, but um, it is, um, you're absolutely right. This is a struggle that we've seen in um, OA clinical trials and also clinical trials in, in other, um, uh, other diseases. Yeah, and I think also what's often been, been sort of interpreted as the placebo effect, I think a substantial chunk of the improvement in the placebo groups is regression to the mean. And it's often undetermined or usually undetermined how, how big that chunk of regression to the mean is really and how much. And, the, and in fact, the placebo response may just be a tiny part of it. We don't really know. Uh, and the other thing, I think it's a really good point you made by, by uh, how we evaluate pain. I think we need to start to redefine our whole system or how we, we do um, collect pain data and classify it. And that single point in time that is typically done in trials, it's, it's, uh, it's really problematic. Right. It goes back to Jillian's point that, you know, we really have not very good pain measures and we're kind of stuck with that um, at the moment in terms of existing studies. And so um, certainly there have been a number of different advances in, in pain, certainly, um, you know, in terms of the promise measures, um, you know, computerized adaptive testing. So um, and then also trying to separate out different pain phenotypes. Um, that may be important. Um, no. Yeah, yeah I, I totally agree. And I think also regression to mean it might explain also why we have so many uh, alternative treatment options in osteoarthritis on the market, because it's a very lucrative market. And it's very easy to, to sort of show some impressive 
effect, so to speak. If you just if you group the, the pa patients with the worst pain and, and, and give them anything, they will improve. <laughs> and you can claim that this is a great treatment. Look, they improve by X and Y points and, and over time and, and so on. It's very easy to make this, this sort of uh, persuasive uh, claims. What I'm seeing, you know, in, in these abstracts you've presented is that there are challenges in clinical trials and clinical trial design. So I'll, I'd like to end with each of you giving your suggestion as to what you'd like to see happen in clinical trials or clinical trial design. Jillian, why don't you start? Thanks. Yes, absolutely. I think we all agree that, that right now we're enrolling people who have effectively advanced osteoarthritis. They have Kelgren and Lawrence grade two or higher. They've got you know, clearly um, chronic persistent pain and disability. And we're unlikely to see a, a great therapeutic response when we're enrolling there. So we are embarking on work to move that uh, entry point earlier through the development of new classification criteria for early stage osteoarthritis. And I think that's absolutely what we need to move the field forward. So I earlier. totally agree with Jillian there. I mean, I think... Uh, we need to move it to an early stage also because before maybe we have this great deterioration of the joint structures and also the, when the, there is maybe less risk that pain sensitization have occurred. And I think that might be a window to, to intervene before this all happens. And, and for that, we need some good uh, ways to identify homogeneous patient populations like Julian. So I think that's tremendously important to move the field forward. So what I've heard so far has been maybe clustering and subgroups. Um, uh, new definitions of pain uh, going earlier. Um, any other ideas, Ken? I, I think that's certainly true. I, you know, the I think part of the point that um, you know Jillian's uh, making is that I, I liken it to a, a rapidly moving freight train. That when we are looking at people late in disease, and you know their um, disease is really moving down a path, um, and it's it's really hard to stop that freight train. And so um, you know, oftentimes you want to you know, uh, companies want to enroll people that are progressing um, so that they can uh, have a, a larger effect size. But the question is really how powerful is those drugs? And so we may be discarding treatments that do have an effect, but we're looking at the wrong, wrong group. And so earlier on, um, the challenge then is uh, finding the right outcome measures to really assess those patients um, in terms of where that progression is and whether um, the, the issue is MRI versus um, uh, x-ray, which uh, many companies are moving to, but I think also better, better patient reported outcome measures um, with, along with those uh, phenotypes and, and the stage of disease. Tahina, why don't you end? Sure. So I, I agree with everything that's been said, and we can sort of do a whole other thing on just the tr challenges of clinical trials in a way, but definitely phenotyping, getting the right patient to the right treatment. I have long been uh, sort of um, asking, are, do, are our outcome measures fit for purpose? Um, are we asking too much of our um, patient reported outcomes to give us a pain rating at year one, two, three, and five, and expect that we're gonna have enough sensitivity to change? Um, I think the, um, the, the phenotyping that we need to do, we need to have empirical evidence from trials to show that these phenotypes actually are meaningful and that there's response in the particular phenotypes. And then I think more kind of a provocative thing is um, the concept of a magic bullet in osteoarthritis. Is it reasonable that targeting a single molecule is going to address all of the things that go on in osteoarthritis? And in cardiovascular disease, we have to manage their diabetes, hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, obesity, smoking, et cetera. In a way, we probably have to do the same. And to expect a single molecule at a KL3 knee to take care of everything is, I think, unrealistic. Setting the stage for the future of osteoarthritis research. I want to thank this international panel for your great thoughts. Um, tell your colleagues to listen to this podcast. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you Thanks very for much. having us.